if that's the case. Uh, let me just tell you, you know, the, it was regarding the Book of Mysteries, and the accusation might as well have been that the Book of Mysteries was based on Nazi teachings or that it, it endorses cannibalism. That's how grounded in reality this charge is. It was, craziness is nothing new. Um, it, ridiculous accusations are nothing new, and that's not the first. It wasn't the first, it won't be the last. Anybody, again, can say anything. What does it mean? Nothing. Um, apparently, from what I heard and actually heard for myself, a man with a conservative news uh, and Christian site uh, on media said something on the air. Now, I'm not questioning his sincerity. I do not. Um, I wish God's will. I wish the best for him. But I have to address what he said. Um, and though he certainly mentioned my name and uh, bore a very crazy, crazy false witness on the air concerning the Book of Mysteries, I'll seek avoiding mentioning his name for his sake. It's not about him, but we have to deal with uh, issues, methodology, um, the actions. You know, um, I did seek to reach out to him. I just got something back, so hopefully pray that God will work that all out. Um, so again, nothing about the man, or, uh, but it is about this that was said, and what was said was lunacy. Apparently, he was getting into the exposing of what he saw as Kabbalah influence or conspiracy or influence of the Kabbalah, which I'll get into what that is, um, uh, in the world. And apparently he heard the book of mysteries. You hear the word mystery, and then it's written by a Jewish person. Mystery, Jewish, put together, Kabbalah, conspiracy. Now, what he said is when he finally got the book, it confirmed what he was thinking, What he uh, that which means he already had got it into his head beforehand that this was based on the Kabbalah before even reading it or having it, which is a hint of uh, that it's going to go off, way off the wall. Um, and again, I'm not saying he is, I'm saying the statement was. Um, and so then he said, well, this proved that it was. What was it? Um, he, took, he looked at the uh, table of contents. He saw the chapter names or the mystery names, and it has some Hebrew words. I mean, there's, there's chapters and there's titles in, totally in English, titles with some Hebrew, titles with some Greek from the New Testament. Um, because I want to, op it's opening, the Book of Mysteries is opening up the Bible and, and there's so many things you can't see in the original that are so cool of God. And so when he saw Hebrew, apparently it was a red flag, took the Hebrew word and added the word Kabbalah and Googled it and found matches that had the Kabbalah and so that Kabbalah made mention of the word. So he said that proves it. On the air, he said the Book of Mysteries is 95% Kabbalah. Well, okay, how much does the Book of Mysteries have to do with anything like the Kabbalah? The short answer is absolutely zero, nothing, nada. It has as much to do with the Kabbalah as it does with the Communist Manifesto or Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, which is absolutely nothing. I'll get back to the, the, his, uh, quote, proof uh, in a few moments. Um, but first, it's impossible, as I've always been totally against the Kabbalah as any source of truth. Uh, just this weekend, someone came up, we had Resurrection Weekend, someone came up to me, I never saw them before, came up and said, oh, hey, I'm, I'm studying Kabbalah. I immediately said what I would say to anybody is don't do that. If you're seeking for any a spiritual truth, you can't do that. Uh, you know, it's one thing if you're doing research for another purpose, but to be studying it for truth, the Kabbalah is always my consistent uh, um, position on it, always been. Uh, Kabbalah is totally whacked out. You can only find the truth in the Word of God, spiritual truth, not in the Kabbalah. Um, it has crazy things in it. It has spiritually crazy. It's, it's, it at parts approaches Eastern religion or pre-existence of the soul or pantheism. Um, whenever I've met someone who says, considering reading it, I said, do not, you know, unless, again, you're doing it for apologetics. I'll get into that in a moment. That's true with anything. I've treated the Kabbalah as I would treat the Quran, um, the Communist Manifesto, uh, anything. Every one of these books... I would know enough to have an accurate idea of what they're about so I can rightly address it and deal with what's needed. Thus, I've, I've read about them. I've looked over some quotes from them to verify as needed, but I don't have the time to be going through all of it. Um, thus, with the Kabbalah, I know just enough about it. I know about it to be able to speak about it, to warn where I need to be or, um, or samples to be able to quote from if I need to. Now, thus... Uh, not only do I warn people about seeking truth in the Kabbalah or anything like that, but it's doubly impossible that the Book of Mysteries have anything to do with this because I've never even read the Kabbalah um, as far as uh, reading through it. Now, as with any one of these books or writings that I consider to be not true or false, 
The only exception of reading it for anybody is for the purpose of research or apologetics or evangelism for the sake of the gospel if the Lord leads you. That would mean either to refute it, to prove it's wrong, to witness to those who believe it, uh, Muslims, you know, Orthodox Jews, communists, whatever, uh, whatever, or to use it as a hostile witness to show the contradictions where it's unwittingly actually proving God, because even in that you can see some amazing things. Um, and for instance, there are also rabbinic writings, which not the Kabbalah. Uh, there is the Talmud, which is not the Kabbalah. That's general writings of the rabbis, which has also historical things or contextual things that have been used for ages by all, you know, most good commentaries um, and evangelical writings on the Bible. That it gives you the, the context, gives you things where we can understand the times of Jesus. In fact, there's something called Alfred Edersheim's The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, the most classic work of scholarship in English, um, popular work of Jesus' life, and it totally uses the rabbinic writings. That's, that's standard. Plus, it's also standard apologetics, first used by Paul on Mars Hill, in Athens, when he specifically used a quote from a pagan hymn, not once, twice, a pagan hymn or pagan poem to Zeus to witness for God to the Greeks in Athens. I once did an apologetic series, an evangel uh, evangelical series, showing how the rabbinical writings actually contradict the rabbinical claim that Jesus is not the Messiah or that Messiah didn't die for our sins and that he, they actually say he did die for our sins. Um, or that the Jewish people can't believe in the Trinity, it actually, there's something in there that says God is three in one. You know, that's special apologetics. And, and that that special series, um, using these contradictions to disprove the claim against Jesus and use it for Jesus, of course, a whacked out fringe, um, even in the kingdom, took that and said, aha, he's endorsing the rabbinical writings or the Kabbalah. Well, which is as crazy, as false, as someone accusing Paul of affirming, of being a believer in Zeus, a Zeus worshiper, because he used a quote to prove the gospel. We can quote from anything, anytime, period. Basic hermeneutics, to quote something doesn't mean you agree with something. Uh, just as a lawyer have, with, a, with a hostile witness on the stand. My stand and warning the Kabbalah has remained the same from the beginning, just as Paul's stand on paganism ha remained uh, the same from the, from the beginning of his preaching. Um, and now what happened, another thing was said on the air on this program. It was said you can't use the word mystery because there's no really mystery, there's no mystery in the Bible except the, the second coming. Really? Well, what Bible are we using? What Bible is that? The Bible uses the word mystery many times. Just one example of Paul, but we speak God's mystery, or we speak his wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the age to our glory. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God. Unless someone, you know, says that they know everything about God, then there, and there's nothing for God to reveal, which would be basically heresy because God is infinite. There's no end to the wonders of God. There's no end to the wonders of his word. There's no end to what we need to seek him for. Then, of course, there are mysteries. Of course, God reveals things and gives us insight that we didn't know before. That's basically it. It's all in the mystery of salvation. Now, what about the proof text or the proof method, which he said he took the name of it, he took a Hebrew name, most likely it's Hebrew, I'm sure, took a, took a chapter name, put the word, and then Googled, put it, added Kabbalah to it, Googled it, and then saw search results where you see this, uh, you see uh, the Kabbalah using the word or anything like that, or the concept you're talking about. Listen, you know, again, I'm not questioning his sincerity, but if you take a Hebrew word, of normal usage, or even not normal usage, from a major piece of writing, like the Book of Mysteries, and then take another source of Hebrew writing, or discourse of any good length, and that is, I'm saying at this point, the Kabbalah, or anything that's Hebrew, you are of course going to find the same words, Hebrew words used in that language, just as you would with English. That's a function of language and of probability. Further, if the Hebrew, if the work that uses a Hebrew word or a Greek word or anything, but it's using it because it's talking about the Bible or biblical concepts. And then you take another source of Hebrew writing that deals with the, also that comments on the Bible, even if it's whacked out like the Kabbalah, then all the more you're going to find some of the same, the same subjects or words talked about. That's a function, again, of language and probability. What does it prove and mean? Absolutely nothing. Example. You, you know, in the Book of Mysteries, you'll have, yeah, again, you have titles totally English, titles with English and some Greek words from the New Testament, a Greek or some, and then titles from, from the Hebrew. Um, you have a title called Elohim, 
uh, Adonai, Ruach, Asham, Baruch Ata, Rachamim, Aliyah. And now, now, if you don't know Hebrew, you can say, okay, this is, this is weird. Well, this is the language of, of most of the Bible and that Jesus would have understood. One of the chapters is called Aliyah in the Book of Mysteries. And, you, and he probably saw it as something strange or mystical out of the word Kabbalah. And lo and behold, he found 300,000 matches. Well, what does that prove? He said, there it is. The book, it, Mysteries, is, has some link to the, well, what does that prove? Zero. Take the word Aliyah and at, now add the word Bible and you won't get 300,000. You'll get 400,000 matches. And on top of that, because the, the word Aliyah is a biblical word. It comes from the Bible. It's a Hebrew word. It means the ascent. It's, it's when you read the Song of Ascents. That's the word Aliyah. It's from the Bible. But according to this method, this very crazy method, what it would tell you is that the Bible, since it uses words that the Kabbalah uses, then the Bible is Kabbalah, which imagine going on the air and saying that. And imagine, you know, I would hope those listening to him wouldn't go out and burn their Bibles. The fact is it's simply a biblical word that anybody can use, any source can use. Another example from the Book of Mysteries, the word Asham. Um, now again, sounds mystical. Well, if you don't know Hebrew, so you, got, you would get 7,000 matches. Does that prove any link between the Kabbalah and uh, the book or, or even zero? You take a sham, put the word Bible next to it, you get 52,000 matches over seven times the amount of matches. Why? Because a sham is simply the biblical Hebrew word used in the Bible, the original word for the guilt offering that first appears in Leviticus. Now, I don't care if Joseph Stalin comments on the Bible, by the method this is, that was used here, it would mean that anybody who comments on the Bible using the same word is a communist. Well, that's how completely crazy this is. Let's go further. Another title from the Book of Mysteries, apply this message, is the word Ruach. Now you get, you do that, he put, you put Ruach and Kabbalah, you get 60,000 matches. But now type in Ruach in the Bible, you get 360,000 matches. Why? Because Ruach is simply the biblical word for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But let's go further. If you remove the Hebrew, and from that you, you translate that back, Ruach, it becomes now Spirit, that's all it means in here, that's the, word, the biblical word for Spirit. Put spirit and Kabbalah, English word, and you get now 400,000 matches. You get more matches in English. And so by this crazy reasoning, you then could go on the air um, and accuse every Christian book that has the word spirit in it and say it's Kabbalah. Or for that matter, every pastor who's ever used the word spirit of being a practitioner of the Kabbalah. And just if you needed any more to see how crazy and erroneous this whole thing is, I went the the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is a standard Reformed theology, but standard Orthodox of Reformed theology. Um, it has some things that believers of different things would not agree with, but it is clearly has standard things. One word there is it has four hundred sixty thousand matches to the Kabbalah. Another has over a million matches to the. This is the so does that mean the Westminster F Confession of Faith is now Kabbalah? The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association Statement of Faith. Check at one word, over 600,000 matches to the Kabbalah. So what does that mean? Billy Graham is a practitioner of the Kabbalah. You've got to burn his books. The Apostles' Creed. The Apostles', the Apostles Creed has one word, over 600,000 matches. That means the Apostles' Creed. I mean, this is crazy. Further, I took one of the words that he uses a lot, the man who said this, and I even wrote this to him. And said, okay, let's put Kabbalah next to that and see how, and it turns out there's over 4 million matches, more than any that was found for anything else. What does that mean? I should go on the air and say that he's a, a practitioner of the Kabbalah. Crazy. And then call for book burnings, which he kind of did. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that led my father to escape Nazi Germany as a boy. That is the mentality that has no place in the body of Messiah. And according you know, to the method used, it would mean, it would have to mean burning Bibles, which is crazy. And Jesus used the same words, the same Hebrew words, as in the Book of Mysteries, Elohim, Ruach, Adonai, all that. So it would have to be saying that most of what Jesus said is Kabbalah, so it's all crazy. So again, this is just to show you, beyond any, any doubt, um, and again, not to question the man's sincerity at all. And, um, but what was said on the air was a great wrong, error and wrong. I pray, I'm praying he has the integrity uh, as a man of of God to go back and make that right. Now, let me say this. For anyone who was rattled, rattled over, it's, it's being rattled over nothing. And um, I got more of this when the Harbinger came out. 
which is a totally different book, but got the same things. A small group of people, generally on the fringes, I'm not saying, not commenting on the man who said this now, but got accused of everything. Um, and it goes on the web and, and, you know, people get, you know, shaken. You know what I was accused of? Replacement theology. What is replacement theology? It says that God is finished with the Jewish people and replaced them with a church. Now, why, how do they get that? Well, because the Harbinger speaks of the, that there are things that happened in Israel in ancient times that are now happening in America. So obviously they, in their mind, okay, that means that America replaced Israel. Crazy. Uh, but crazier, I don't think any, I don't think they realize I'm Jewish. So to believe in that, I'd have to say that God, I believe in God replacing me with myself. Now, what else? I was accused of masonry, Freemasonry. Um, why? Because in the Harbinger, it mentions a tree, and Masons also mention trees. I guess they Googled tree and Mason. My great aunt Mimi had an apple tree. She was always tending to it, so I guess that means my aunt Mimi was a Mason. And they threw in Kabbalah and Gnosticism just on top of that. Another accusation, Mormonism, that I, was, that I was a Mormon, basically, or secret Mormon, or British Israelism. Again, why? Because Mormonism says America was founded from Israel, so therefore they saw America and Israel obviously has to be Mormon. Prosperity doctrine. You know, I don't know how they got that one. Um, you know, right now when I preach, you know, and I'm wearing, when I pre I'm wearing shoes. Someone said, you got to get new shoes <laughs> that have to be 20 years old, and I'm fine with it. The, the, the picture you see in the Harbinger, kind of the famous picture of me like this, um, what studio was that taken? Uh, that was taken at Sears Budget Photos. And the only reason I had it taken at Sears Budget Photos was because there's no photo studio at Walmart. Otherwise, I would have gone to Walmart. What does this tell you? And I'm, I'm kind of using, I'm using humor a little bit. And that is that it tells you this. People are crazy. People are nuts. And even that gets into the kingdom, unfortunately. And often people project what's in their hearts or what they're dealing with onto what they're seeing. Um, some may be sincere, some may not be sincere, some may be malicious. But it was the same way with Paul. He was accused of everything, and so were the Lord. And it's never, it's not the beginning, it's not the end. That's part of life. And that, that's part of, unfortunately, it's part of uh, the kingdom sometimes, or people sometimes going off in the kingdom. Uh, but the enemy is behind, is the enemy, is the accuser of the brethren. And he'll use anything he can. But we cannot be like children tossed by everything that people say. We're to be stable and solid. Some principles. Beware of looking for evil, because if you look for evil, you'll find it. Because whether it's there or not, you'll find it. Because the enemy will be more than glad to assist you in dwelling on evil. Even though, and he works through appearances, works through things that look like they're connected and they're not. And make sure you always know the context. The enemy will always take things out of context, just as he did with the Lord. Do not judge by appearances, judge by truth. Paul quoted from a hymn to Zeus. Does that mean he's a Zeus worshiper? Of course not. It's God looks at the heart and the purpose. And don't be quick to judge or to accept the judgments of men. Do not accept judgments that are based on guilt by association, which applies in numerous realms. Do not accept judgments that are based on trigger words. You heard a certain word and this one said this and suddenly that's, that's right. You know, somebody, for instance, we know that Eastern meditation is wrong, is off. You know, that doesn't mean the word, somebody uses the word meditate. It's a bad word because the Bible says meditate on the Lord. Be a Berean. You don't need somebody to make judgment for you when you have the word itself. You need to read the word of God yourself and see, and, and God is able to speak to you. And if you've known something, you don't let someone just rattle you because they threw something out. And in another sense, you don't need to have somebody tell you what a book says when you have the book. You read it for yourself. Don't put yourself on the judge's bench to judge the body. It's human nature. And we have a million ways of rationalizing it to try to make it spiritual. But God has a way of humbling those who do. And do not panic just because somebody says something or somebody flakes out or somebody, anybody can say anything. When the enemy attacks, and this is true in your life, if you're in God, it's a good sign. And actually, it's often a sign that what he's attacking is very much of God. I was actually getting a little concerned because the Book of Mysteries didn't have, it's been so hailed and so uh, blessed and praised by believers that didn't get so much attacks. I was getting a little worried, now I can rest. It tells you it must be powerful. And, it, and, and let me turn this for good. If you haven't gotten the Book of Mysteries, and this is not to plug for, but get it, you're going to be blessed. Um, and as far as the Book of Mysteries, so you know what this is about, 
The Book of Mysteries has been, and I only say this for those who were rattled, hailed from every side, um, and you know, from the from Baptist leaders, uh, charismatic leaders, uh, Christian leaders all over. Of course, it's totally biblical and totally Christian. Um, and in fact, I was, and I'm only saying it for this reason. I normally don't like saying it. I don't like bringing it up because I feel like I'm pushing something. But for you, for the purpose of of helping in this, you know. Um, I was on the, the air with somebody who's been in the Lord, I don't know, I believe 50 years. I mean, a, a scholarly man, a, a leader, solid, down to, you know, totally uh, grounded. And he's, he told me that the Book of Mysteries, he picked up the C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity 50 years ago, changed his life. He said, no book has had that effect until the Book of Mysteries. He put C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, and then as far as no Christian book as the Book of Mysteries. We're getting responses from all over, Christians who love, who, who their love for God has been set on fire again, who are being revived, who are being amazed, who are being encouraged, strengthened, set free. And what I'm really blessed about is people are giving the Book of Mysteries uh, to non-believers as a gift and they're getting saved. And I haven't heard of anybody, any non-believer turning it down yet because it looks like a really, a real gift. So I'm so blessed with that. It will open up the Bible to you in ways, open up your life. And if you take what it says and take the application, there's scriptures on every page, it'll change your life. Um, and let me just, you know, wanna, I want to kind of close it with a positive thing. Let, you know, the book of history can speak for itself. And I'm just going to read you, give you an example of what's in it. And I particularly am going to choose ones with Hebrew words in the title, which is not all of them, but just because of what was said here. Um, let me give you a, a taste of one. One is called, this is from the book of mysteries. It's called the mystery of the Tamid. It was mid afternoon. He took me into a chamber in the middle of which was a large golden stone model of the Temple of Jerusalem. We were viewing it from what would have been the temple's eastern side, the side closest to the altar of sacrifice. Now this is what you shall offer on the sacrifice, said the teacher. He was reciting a passage of scripture. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you will offer at twilight. This, he said, was the law of the Tamid, Tamid was the name given to the sacrifices that were to be offered every day in the temple. So each day the offerings would begin with the sacrifice of the morning lamb and finish with the sacrifice of the evening lamb. All the other sacrifices would come in between the two. Was there a specific ritual to the offering of the Tamid, I asked? The morning lamb would be offered up at the third hour of the day. With its death, the temple trumpets would sound and the temple gates would be opened up. Then at the ninth hour... The evening sacrifice would be slain and offered on the altar, at which time all the sacrifices would be finished. So the morning lamb, I said, was offered at the third hour. What time is that? Nine o'clock, said the teacher. And when was Messiah crucified, he asked? The same hour, nine in the morning. So as the morning lamb was slain on the altar, the lamb of God was lifted up on the altar, the cross, and the trumpets were sounded to announce the sacrifice and the temple gates were open. And the evening lamb, I said, at the ninth hour, what time was that? Three in the afternoon, he said. Isn't that when Messiah died on the cross? It was. So the sacrifice of Messiah began with the offering up of the morning lamb and ended with the offering of the evening lamb. And it all took place during the six hours of the temple sacrifices. In between the two lambs, from the first sacrifice to the last, the lamb of God, said the teacher is all in all, covering every moment, every need, every sin, every problem, and every answer. He is the Tamid. You never told me, I said. What does Tamid mean? It means continual, daily, perpetual, always and forever. And so he will be there for you always and will be your answer continuously, every day, always and forever. For Messiah is the Lamb, and not only the Lamb, but your Tamid. That is the mystery of the Tamid. Let me give you a little bit more. I pray you're blessed. Let me give you a little bit more with that. And I'm going to give you one called, also with a uh, Hebrew word, called Ruach. Again, what is Ruach? Ruach is the Spirit. So listen to this. This is Ruach. This is day four. And you have hundreds of these for every day of the year. He took me to an open desert plain. It was a windy day, so, so windy it was almost violent. Come, said the teacher. He was asking me to walk against the winds blowing, so I did. What is it like to walk against the wind, he asked. 
It's a struggle, I, I replied. In the language of Scripture, he said, the word for wind is ruach, but it has another meaning. It also means the Spirit. In Hebrew, the Holy Spirit is the holy wind. So what happens if you walk against the wind? It creates drag, I said. It becomes harder to walk and you get tired. In the same way, he said, when you walk against the Spirit, it creates a drag on your life. Everything you do becomes harder. It takes more energy to do less. So when you go against His Spirit, you're fighting against the wind. And you can't walk against the direction of the wind without getting weary and worn out. And what way is the direction of the wind, the Spirit, I asked. The Spirit, he said, is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it blows in the direction of the holy and blows against the direction of the unholy. Now try something else. Turn around. Walk back the same way you came. So I did. I was now walking in the direction of the winds blowing. And what was that like, he asked. It was much easier, I said. That's because there was no drag. You were walking in the direction of the wind and the wind helped you walk. It moved you ahead. It made your walking easier. So when you walk against the wind, it creates drag. But if you turn around, then the wind gives you power. So it is with the Spirit. If you turn, if you change your course, if you repent, if you walk in the Spirit, then the drag will disappear on your life. Then the Spirit will empower you and will move you forward. And then everything you do that you must do will become easier. So if you walk in the Spirit, I said, life will go from being a drag to a breeze. Yes, said the teacher. For those who walk in the Spirit, the wind is at their back. Okay, one last one, and we just edited this because I misread, uh, I forgot to read a sentence here. One last one is, I pray you'll be blessed with, is Rachamim. And this is day 56 in the Book of Mysteries. And here's what it says. Do you believe, said the teacher, that God has mercy? Yes, I replied. Of course, you've taught me that. No, said the teacher. God does not have mercy. With all respect, I said cautiously, that's not right. It was the first time I ever contradicted him in such a direct way. Prove your point, he said. I was just reading the book of Daniel. In it, Daniel prays for God's mercy on the people of Israel. He says, to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. It doesn't say that, he replied, not in the original language. It says, to the Lord belongs rachamim. What is rachamim? Some would translate it, as mercy, but rachamim is not a singular noun, it's plural. It doesn't mean mercy, it means mercies. It means that God's mercy is more than mercy. God's mercy is so great, so strong, and so deep, it can't be contained in a single word. Rachamim means that his mercy has no end. What about the word for sin, I asked? What do you mean? Is it by nature singular or plural? The word for sin, said the teacher, is singular. But the word for mercy is plural, I said. And what does that tell you, he asked. That no matter what my sin is, no matter how great, the mercy of God is always greater. And no matter how much I've sinned, no matter how many sins I have, the mercies of God are more than my sins. Yes, said the teacher. So don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you've exhausted God's mercy. You never have. You never could. And you never will. He will always have more mercies than you have sins. More than enough to cover every sin and to still have enough compassion left over to love you forever. For what the Lord has for you is not mercy, but rachamim. I pray that blesses you. And that is a taste of what the Book of Mysteries has, contains for you, what it's all about. Um, And if you don't have it, get it. You're going to be blessed. Even if you just heard all this talk I believe the Lord will use this for good. You, you will be blessed. Now, by the way, keep me in prayer. Right now, I'm working on, a, on the next book. I'm writing it right now. God willing, it will come out in September. It's going to be like the Harbinger in many ways, and it's going to be explosive. Uh, so pray for me for that. And, and this probably attack is going to be nothing when this book comes out. It's going to be called The Paradigm. Um, so pray. I'm kind of staying up late to do this now. So to conclude... We have too many important things to do uh, to, get, to get wrapped up, to get messed up, to get shaken, too much to get our eyes off of the, what God has called us for. America is on the edge. People are going to hell. We've got a great commission. So let's get on with the great things that God has for us. And for all, and don't be so easily moved back and forth. I, I, I'm thankful for all of you who are strong in the Lord and also all of you who pray. 
who pray for me, who encourage, who support the ministry. You have become part of the ministry. Thank you so much. Um, again, I didn't plan this. It may be good. We had a chance to share it today. Um, but if there's anybody who, who heard anything, got into it, you feel free to use this and even use it just to um, get strong in the principles that we have to have in all, so, all things like that. So thank you, and let me give you the Ronic blessing. And this is from number six. The words are from the Lord himself. The Lord bless you, my friend, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord pour out his grace upon you, lift up the glory of his countenance on your life, and the Lord give you shalom. Life, peace, and all the blessings of his love. B'Shem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, and the glory of Israel. God bless you, my... So if the stage is that of the tree, or that's the, the principle of the tree. In the Bible, God speaks of trees a lot, and trees are a symbol that he uses in the Bible to represent nations. And he, I mean, clearly, he represents Israel as a tree. Israel's an olive tree. Israel is a fig tree. Right. Israel, you know, all these things. Um, t- why? Because trees are living. Trees are growing. Trees are like a genealogy. When you do a family tree, it's a tree. It's like a genealogy. The nation of Israel is a tree. Trees are planted like nations. God planted Israel is a nation. They have a lifespan. Uh, trees are used to represent nations and kingdoms. But in the same way, I mean, I mean, look, for instance, look at the olive tree. You know, the church is called, it's grafted into the olive tree. Right. You know, Jesus looks at a fig tree. Mm-hmm. All these things are symbols of nations and kingdoms. And so, and, or the church in one sense. So at the same time, God uses the same symbol as well when he speaks of judgment of a nation. And that is in the Bible. For instance, John the Baptist says the ax is laid to the root of the tree. He's, he's going to fall. And he's pro- prophesying Israel's going to fall. The judgment is going to come there and it's going to come as to a tree. We have, we have the picture of the, of the, God says in the prophets, what I have planted, I will uproot. We have the thing in the harbinger. We have the picture of the sycamore tree being struck down, yes. which Isaiah 9, 10 and 9, 11, it happens. And we have, we have, there's a picture of the falling of a nation. So God, so, our, so there are also other pictures, not just the striking down, but here's another prophetic picture that we should know to know about the future of a nation. Ezekiel 17, 8 says, speaks about Israel or speaks about nations, says, it was planted in good soil, mm. in good waters, that it could put forth branches, it might bear fruit. But then, verse 9, thus says the Lord, shall it prosper? Shall it he not pull up its roots, shall it, shall it wither. It shall wither all the leaves. It shall wither. That which was planted will not prosper. It shall wither. So one of the signs of biblical judgment of a nation is a tree yes. not struck down or a tree withering away. Wow. When, Matt, when, when Messiah cursed the tree, yes, you know, that's taken as a symbol. Well, of course, he wasn't saying goodbye to Israel because God says, you know, Paul says, God, God forbid. But that Israel, that or that kingdom was was judged. So there's a withering. Image of a withering is image of, of a nation cut off from God. It is, it is, on the outside, it still has the outward form, but it's dying spiritually. It's dying. The fruit is not being born, and it is, has outward form, but it's cut off from the roots, so it's decaying inside, and one day it just is all revealed. So that's one sign of biblical judgment of a nation. But another one is the cutting off of branches of a tree. Mm. And that's in Ezekiel 31. It says, it says the nations have cut him off They've, they've cut off his branches. Daniel 4, uh, 11 says the tree grew, but then it says the branches were cut off. In Jeremiah 11, it says the Lord called your name a green olive tree and good, but the branches are broken off. And, and then one more in Isaiah 27, it says when the, when the bows are, broke, are withered, the, they'll be broken off. So you got the sign of the withering, got the sign of branches coming off, which speaks of the, speaks of the removal of a nation's power, the removal of what it had, dismemberment. And then you've got one more thing here, and that is a biblical sign of judgment is the destruction of the cedars. You'll hear God speaks about the tall cedars, I will cut them down. Cedar as, is a symbol of strength. Now, and, and it speaks about the glory of Lebanon. I'll be cut down, I'll cut mm-hmm. down the glory of this yeah. nation. Strike down the, the cedar tree. But we, we realize something, because we know we have a little Hebrew. The cedar tree isn't, doesn't really say cedar, it says Erez tree. Mm-hmm. And Erez tree happens to be one of the harbingers. So now we're going to bring this thing home. It just so happens, we saw this thing last time, that when the the Israelites said, we're going to defy God, they planted the Erez tree, symbol of strength, where the sycamore had fallen, Isaiah 9.10. 
We saw it actually took place at ground zero. They lowered down that tree, and you actually you see it there. That is the Erez tree. They're lowering it down into the exact spot of the sycamore, the biblical act of replacement of defiance. Okay? Now, what's the odds of that happening at 9-11? <laughs> What's, what's the odds of every single one of these every, every harbinger. Every single one. And then the scripture on top of it is proclaimed with people who don't even know it's actually happening. It all happens. And that's an evergreen tree. It kind of looked a little bit like that. That's a, that's a fruit. It was, it's a sign. In, in Hebrew, eras means strength, firmness. It's a sign of evergreen. We're coming back. They call it, this is the tree of hope. They have a ceremony around the tree. Yes. The man starts saying, this is a, this is a symbol. They're talking about, this is another symbol of America is going to rise and rise stronger, come back stronger. But it's a hope. That's not a hope of God. That's the problem. It's a hope without God. They call it the tree of hope. So this represents America. Defiant thing. So now, here is it. Putting now, it down. We actually called it the tree of hope. Yes. America calls yes. it the tree of hope. Yes. So and it's like our hope is, that's a symbol of our hope. Yes. It, in, yeah, without, in our renewal. Really, with, yes. With that renewal and coming back stronger. It's, this, by the way, it's a fast-growing tree. This is a, it's supposed to shoot up. It's, it's a very fast tree, and so this is a tree of hope. Every one of the harbingers becomes like a symbol. They, call the, they give it a name. They give the stone. They call it the freedom stone. They, the tower, the freedom tower. They call this one the sycamore of ground zero. They call this one the tree of hope. Everything becomes a symbol and has a ceremony. This one has mm-hmm, a ceremony. Mm-hmm. So there it is. There it is. But remember what the, what this, the sign of national judgment it says, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither away? What, happened, what has happened to the tree of hope? The Erez tree at ground zero, mm-hmm. the seventh harbinger is now withering away. Oh, really? Withering away, utterly withering oh, away. Do you remember what you saw before? It was a rich tree? Yes. Mm-hmm. Look at that. That's when it was planted. Look at it now. It's dying. The, look at that. The people of, of St. Paul's cannot save it. They're trying to save it. They can't understand they can't what they can't understand why it's dying. This represents America after 9-11. They can't understand. Remember what we said what the withering tree represents? Oh, God. It represents a, something cut off from God, and it is cut off. It still has outward form, but it's spiritually dying. And so here it is. When I was there with a member of Congress, very famous, the member of Congress fell on the ground when they saw this. Literally really? fell on the ground, on the knees, on the soil, and it was was in deep prayer when they saw this. When they saw this oh, tree, man. now a re- you saw a recent picture of the tree. Shall it not the biblical sign of judgment? But also the other biblical sign is that its bran- the branches of the tree representing the nation are cut off. That is the tree of hope. Now they've cut off yes. branches because they're withering away. It's cutting it off. This is the seventh harbinger, the biblical sign of judgment, the biblical sign of a nation to be that is going to be cut off from its glory. That is the sign. And here's something else. That, that, that tree of hope is standing because there is a rope holding it up now. Oh. Do you have that? There. Oh, my. A rope is holding it up. It holding now, up. this is supposed to be an evergreen tree, so it doesn't, Shed. It's, it's supposed leaves. to always be green, green and always be that. And in the commentaries about the Erez tree, it says the nation, instead of heeding the warning of God, does, determines to rise up in, in its, own, its own strength. It will exchange its feeble sycamores for cedar or Erez trees, which nothing can strike down. Well, that's what we did. And now, though, without anything, wind, anything, it's dying. And I want to show you another thing it's almost as if it's cursed because if you look when we were there we were there in september so everything was green it wasn't fall yet green around everything in that place was green right at the corner of ground zero the only thing that wasn't was the tree of hope as if that place that thing was cursed it was brown withered everything around it was was except now let me say, there there are bushes that come forth from that tree there's 10 bushes planted and they're all in a row the 10 the 10 bushes the five that are away from the tree are green. The five that are near the tree are brown and dying. Look at it. Look at that. Wow. Now that's scary. Anybody knows prophetic look, things? Look at, look that's at that. scary, folks. Look at that. Everything is cursed. In fact, if you even look at the bottom of that tree, even the weeds are dying. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how, that's how cursed this thing is. At the corner of ground, look at that, at ground zero. And they can't save it. And the, and the 
And you see that there again. And I mean, and it's so dramatic. If you look at the bush, you look at one bush next to the next, you see one is alive and the other is dead. Oh, wow. And that is the biblical is sign. That, does that ropes symbolize something to you? That it's, well, the Lord gives that as a sign of judgment saying, this thing you're holding it up, it's, it's tottering, it's going to fall. It's, gonna, it's, it's being held up, you know, and there's no strength in it. It's being held up, propped up, it's going to fall. And the other thing is, since 9-11, we've never gotten out of it. It's never been that we were released. There's 9-11, then came the economy, and we are still under this cloud. We have never, and it's like this tree. And spiritually, we just saw what happened recently when America chose the, a way of, and very dramatically, away from God to go further and faster. Mm-hmm. And it's like that tree that's still in the outward form. You still have stuff. That's, a, a tree doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in a second. It's still there. But what's happening is inside, it's spiritually withering away. Mm. It's cut off from God. And as it keeps going, it becomes weaker and weaker, where suddenly in one second, it can fall because it's been happening all along. So that is the warning. That is, we saw on one hand, right next to the tree, I don't know if you have a picture of what's in back of it because you have, a, you have two harbingers right there. I don't know if you have it, but uh, there's another picture where you'll see the tree and in back of it is that, that's the, the, the two harbingers right there. Oh, that is wow. the tower. Mm. Those are the two The two harbingers that are still in progress are changing. One is going up, the other is withering away, and they are they are together there. And you know the other one is on the top is going to have those the word of the defiant vow on the top beam, and right next to it is the dying the dying harbinger, the dying symbol. That's crazy. So yeah, so when we saw this, we just I mean we were everybody was stunned. I mean it was so dramatic, and the people of that that place said. We can't understand what's happening. We've tried everything. We cannot, we cannot stop this tree from dying. Here's the thing, and, and I, I'll, I, I'm hesitating to say what I'm going to say. We have blamed a, a former president, really, mm-hmm. for our financial problems. How come the whole world is in financial chaos? Was that our former president's problem? Did he cause the whole world to collapse? And I'm not defending... Uh, our former president or condemning our president. I w- I, we pray for our presidents. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. we're supposed to mm-hmm. do. That's what Christians are supposed to do, mm-hmm. to pray for those in leadership. The very act of 9-11, we've had to reorganize our defense. We have to reorganize, you know, get on an airplane. Do you not realize mm-hmm. it's a lot different? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had surplus in mm-hmm. some areas of America. Mm-hmm. 9-11 destroyed us financially. But see, we refuse to believe that God is trying to say something to America. So we have to blame it on somebody. The Bible called them scapegoats. And I don't know if you know biblically what a scapegoat is. You do, Rabbi, I know. But they put the sins on this goat and send it out into the wilderness. We have to blame somebody. You understand what I'm saying? America better repent and say, God, forgive us. Right. We must turn to God. That is the hope. That is the healing. 